Hello, this is Victor. I'm, I'm your host today. This is a Sir Bat Jim, the new Sir Bat Jim. And uh, we'll be talking to Mark, and I'd like to introduce you now and have him start at the beginning. Okay. Well, what, what specifically? Where, where I was born May 3rd, 1950, and where should I proceed from there? Oh, a tourist like me. Uh, I, I don't believe in astrology, so go ahead. <laughs> I don't either, but uh, where were you born? Akron, Ohio. Oh, okay. And uh, did you go in the military right away, or did you... Uh, yeah, when I was a day old, I went out and enlisted. And okay. Went, I'm kidding you, Victor. All right, <laughs> I, uh, when I was in high school, I grew up in a small town in Ohio. When I was in high school, I got a four-year Army ROTC scholarship. So I started the next year in the fall of 1968 at Kent State uh, University as a cadet. And I majored in German, and I studied for a year in Europe and four years at Kent State. Graduated in June 1973 and got commissioned. Went in the Army. And I worked in the spy business. Um, the spy business? Yeah, espionage. Well, that must have been fascinating. It was interesting, but it's not glamorous. People, It's not like a James Bond movie, trust me. Um, Pussy Galore never came to my office, and uh, I didn't drive up a souped-up Ferrari or anything. But we, we ran sources and we had access to a lot of class, classified information. My business basically was to gather information on the Soviet Union. Do you work worldwide, pretty much? Soviet or? Union, the country called the Soviet Union. That's what my business was, to gather information on them. And in Europe. How had, um, who was in power in uh, the Soviet Union when you? Uh, Brezhnev. Um, and then uh, Brezhnev was in power. Was it this was during the time, I don't want to dwell a whole lot of the, on the intelligence business because it's complex and it could take a lot of time, but oh, of course. One, what just, uh, I, um, in the early 70s there was a Jewish senator from the state of New York, Jacob Javits. I remember him. And the Russians could not grow enough wheat to feed themselves. They were starving, so they wanted to buy wheat from the United States. And Javits put an amendment, which was uh, approved, passed by the Senate, and essentially said this, if you want to eat, if you want your wheat, then you will have to permit 50,000 Jews every year to emigrate to Israel. Suddenly, people hated living in the Soviet Union. It was an oppressive third world country. It was terrible. Uh, next to the Soviet Union in those days, Mexico looks like paradise. And so they wanted to get out. And uh, uh, suddenly a lot of Russians discovered they were Jewish. <laughs> and so they would go to Israel. And Israel, it's part of their constitution or part of their laws that if you come to Israel, if you immigrate to Israel, they call it doing Aliyah, then if you're a man, you must be circumcised. Well, a lot of these men were not circumcised. So for a 35-year-old man to be circumcised is a painful operation. And uh, so suddenly, then they declared themselves political refugees because they were going to be tortured by the Israelis. And West Germany at that time had it in their constitution that they must allow anyone who had bona fide, could bona fide establish that they were a refugee from political prosecution, persecution, um, that West Germany would allow them in. And so West Germany allowed a lot of these people in there. Now, they really didn't want to go to West Germany. They wanted to go to the United States. So the West Germans would turn them over to us, and we ran a hotel. We had a lot of complex operations, and we would take these guys, we'd interview them. Um, and maybe one out of 10, we'd be interested in for intelligence purposes. And we take them and we would say to them, okay, look, you want to go to the U.S.? Oh, yeah, I want to go to the U.S. And then we say, okay, if you answer our questions, we will not only pay you, we will get you a visa to the United States, a driver's license, and help with other paperwork matters. That's one of the things I did. I helped that. And I was company commander of the United States Army European uh, Documents and Trans Translation and Documents Company, so I uh, oversaw the translation of thousands of documents <coughs> every year from different European languages into English. 
And uh, I also uh, supervised interrogations. That's what I did. It was very interesting. I loved my work. <clears throat> I didn't wear a uniform most of the time, but it was uh, not glamorous. So what's um, then? You got out of the military. I guess you retired. Well, I went into the reserves in 1986. Got promoted to major the next day, and then I was in the reserves for 14 years, and I was retired. Uh, June 30th, 2001, for the reserves at the rank of lieutenant colonel. So now I'm a retired lieutenant colonel. Then uh, you started a new life now. No, in 1980, well, actually, <clears throat> while I was still in the Army, stationed in California, I started working in the financial management business. And um, I was making more money there than I was in the Army, even just part time, I was making more money. So I got out of that, I got into this, and I've been in this ever since. And how long has that that's been? Well, I got a license, <clears throat> what they call the Series 7, and uh, a license to sell securities in September 1984. So that's been 33, is that, yeah, 33 years now. Full the, time. Then you come to Kingman. Uh, uh, well, I worked in uh, California for a while, and I moved to Phoenix. I worked out of there for 11 years, and I was getting more business out of Kingman than anywhere else. And I was tired of living on the road because in those days I was driving over a thousand miles a week easily. And so I moved up here and I was closer to a customer base and I put roots down in Kingman. What kind of hobbies do you have or do you have any? What do you do in your... Well, I read the Bible, I study linguistics. I'm still, I've always, well, <clears throat> I've been captivated by the science of linguistics since I was a freshman in college. And uh, I still study linguistics uh, much. I, I read a lot. Uh, my Hebrew is pretty much self-taught. I went to German night school uh, for a year and a half to learn Hebrew, and then I self-taught my. Then I self-taught basically, and I, I read it this morning. I read Hebrew to keep myself at some degree of fluency. I cannot speak Hebrew. That's modern Hebrew. It's purely classical. And also Yiddish, which is a combination of German, which I speak, and Hebrew. So it's another language, and I also I can get by that. Fascinating. I studied Russian. I studied French, but that's because I had a girlfriend in France. And um, uh, I studied a little bit of Dutch and smattering of other languages. I've actually, I don't know if you could go so far as to say I've studied. I've looked at the core vocabulary of the Acoma Indians in New Mexico and also the Walpi Indians out here. Uh, and was looking for Hebrew cognates, in other words, Hebrew words that might be in their language. And I actually found them in both languages. So I'm sort of a Indiana Jones in my armchair. <laughs> Sounds like it. Uh and what keeps you in Kingman? This is home now, I guess. Well, um, I do a lot of my business on the phone, so I could actually conduct a lot of my business from somewhere else. I mean, it's in the, anywhere where they got a phone. <clears throat> I got my secretary here. Your son-in-law is my maintenance guy, and I own this building. It's paid for in full. Um, I could lease out part of it. I, I'm not sure how I'm going to conduct myself or where I'm, where I'm going to conduct my business in the future. I'm pretty sure I'll stay in Kingman. And uh, this is your fun then? This, uh, this is my what? It, what do you do for fun? Do you? Uh, well, this is fun. This, this is yeah, fun. Yeah, getting interviewed right? by Victor. That's fun. <laughs> um, you know, I, and reading Hebrew and before I broke my hip, I like to hike. I hiked, hiked Arizona a lot. I uh, liked being stationed down in Fort Huachuca when I was in the Army. That's in the southeast corner of Arizona. And uh, well, beautiful mountains down there, just like all over Arizona. I lived in Flag for two years, Flagstaff. Um, you said southeast Arizona? That's where I was stationed twice. Uh, it's the U.S. Army Intelligence School training. So anybody that's a career intelligence officer is going to be at Huachuca a few times, and I was. Huh, I've never heard of that. Uh, that you never heard of Fort Huachuca? You've heard of Bisbee? Oh yeah, Tombstone. Been, been, been to Bisbee, it's near Tombstone, Tombstone, Bisbee, and Douglas. Been to Safford. And yeah, it's not far. Um, 
interesting. Uh, what do you? What's your favorite food? What do you like to eat? <laughs> what's my favorite food? <laughs> beer. Beer. That, that makes sense. <laughs> I, I think I, seriously, I think you could live on dark beer and nothing else. You probably could, uh, because it contains so many uh, amino acids and carbohydrates. Well, most of what you live. <laughs> and if it didn't, you wouldn't care anyway. <laughs> <coughs> Pardon me. No, I, well, I, I, I don't. I mean, I like eggs, but I, I'm not a. I'm not a big on eating. I mean, I'm all for eating, but I never have been a big eater ever. Not when I was kid. Not that's one reason why I'm skinny. Um, no desserts either. No sweets. I almost never eat uh, sweets. I've never smoked a cigarette. Wow. Yeah. Never. Not once in my life. And I tried, I got my marijuana card and I tried smoking marijuana because I had the pain connected with the hip and um, didn't didn't make me bust. All it did for me is give me a smoker's hack. And so that was it. Didn't help your pain at no, all? No, I didn't do anything. Didn't give me the munchies, nothing. Wow, that's... Uh... No, I mean, you, people sometimes go, well, try the, what do you call it, the cookies or whatever, brownies, and I did. I had a few of those, and man, it's, that almost made me sick. So it, it could just be psychosomatic, something like that. I don't know, but I figure I don't need another habit, so I didn't try it anymore. I think January is the last time I smoked marijuana. What, what does your uh, business here entail? I mean, uh, you give financial advice and yeah. invest and... Uh... Yeah, and I got clients, I used to say all over the world, uh, I don't anymore, I have clients outside the United States, I don't think, uh, but a lot of them, um, I talk with them on the phone, and guide them on there, they don't really need to see me face to face, unless it's the women that are, just have a crush on me, then of course they want to see me. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of advice, financial advice would you give a young person starting to, these days? Well, I'd have to talk to the young person in person. And um, I, one thing I would say to the young person is that you must understand this thing they call Social Security it will not be here when in 30, 40 years. When you get to be retirement age, there will be no such thing as Social Security. So you will have to be more responsible for yourself than, for instance, what my grandparents were. Because my granddad was born in 1892. He started working at the age of 15, rolling cigars. That was his first job. He didn't even come into Social Security, I think, until 1930, sometime in the 30s, 38 maybe. And at that time, it was only 1%. Now, Social Security is 15% of your paycheck. You might only see 7.5%, but your employer's paying the other 7.5%. And it just, so my granddad retired at the age of 65, and he'd hardly put anything into it. And he started getting a nice check from, uh, Social Security and lasted him from 1957 to 1983. Well, it really worked out for him, but it's not going to work out for you. A lot of uh, seniors here in Kingman, uh, what would you recommend for them just after they've retired? I recommend they talk to me. I mean, the advice is it's client specific because you have some seniors with a lot of money, you have some seniors that are in poverty, and a lot of people are in between. Life expectancy is a big factor. Of course, we don't know exactly how long we're going to live, but um, uh, you know, I ask them sometimes about their uh, family history. It's longevity. Like my family, we all have longevity. I had an aunt lived to be 104, and so I have to take a long-term approach to planning. If most of the people in your family die at the age of 65 of a heart attack, well, then you don't have to be so concerned about saving long-term. And, um, how would they get in touch with you? Uh, do you? What's your phone number and what's your address here? My in phone number is 928-753-KING. That's 753-928-753-KING. Uh, or 928-753-8984. That's, those are my two business numbers. I have fax and, of course, email, all that stuff. And what's your address here? 1001 Stockton Hill Road, 
Kingman, Arizona, 86401. You have any funny stories from when you were in the military? I bet there's got to be some <laughs> near disasters or... Uh, yeah, near disasters, funny <laughs> stories. Well, this isn't funny. It's ironic, so you might be interested in this. Okay, that sounds good. All right. Um, as you may remember, when the Cold War started, the Cold War started as soon as the hot war was over, 1945. And so once we developed the technology we built what they called U-2s. They were a spacecraft, I mean an aircraft, very large wings, fuel efficient uh, jet engines. And we would launch them, they would fly over Russia and take photos every day. Every day we were flying over Russia taking photos. And of course the Russians knew we were doing this but they couldn't do anything to stop us until 1962 when they shot down uh, Gary Francis Powers who was piloting a U-2, he was shot down and captured, and it was a big deal back then. So anyway, they would uh, fly over every day in the 50s, and they'd take photos, and, and then they'd go back to where, I think they, were, they went back to England. I don't remember what their pattern was. They flew off in Turkey and landed in England, something like that. And they go back, and then the photos were analyzed. And one day, uh, in the 50s, I think it was 54, they noticed that the photo from the day before there was a town, I don't remember the name, I'll just say Schmolensk. Well, just, just a made-up name, Schmolensk. It's a long time ago, I don't remember. So Schmolensk was there. The next day they flew over there, Schmolensk was not there. And the CIA analysts were scratching their heads, figuring, what in the world happened to Schmolensk? A, an entire town disappeared in 24 hours? There was nothing. And... So, when you're in the intelligence business, we have uh, uh, um, defense uh, intelligence requirements, DIRs, I think is what they're called, and um, this could be from the CIA, the defense intelligence agencies, I think even the State Department, the various military services. We want to know what happened to Smolensk. And so the different, intelli different intelligence people would be trying to find out what happened to Smolensk, where did Smolensk go? And for 20 years, no one could find out what happened to Smolensk. So in uh, the place where I was working, we would interrogate all these refugees <clears throat> coming through. We had a guy come through from Russia, and we were paying him to resettle the United States, giving him money, helping him with his paperwork. He was also a Jew, or claimed to be a Jew, and went to Israel, bounced out, and came to West Germany, where we were. And um, he said to us, hey, would you like to know what happened to Smolensk? And we looked in our, yeah. just know what happened to Smolensk. Just like that? Yeah, just like that. Well, he kind of figured he'd probably not want to know what happened, and so he wanted to be a good source, so we'd give him more money and work on his case. And, you know, we said, well, so we looked, I mean, because this is in the 70s, and Smolensk disappeared in the 50s, so we looked under our uh, defense intelligence requirements and thought, well, yeah, of course, we want to know what happened to Smolensk. Well, what happened to Smolensk is... In the late 40s, early 50s, when the Soviets had just developed their nuclear technology, instead of using proper disposal techniques to get rid of the waste, they had, uh, they, they had a bulldozer, and the guy would just push the nuclear waste up into a pile around the town of Smolensk. I don't know how long this went on. It could have been a couple of years. But one day when he's pushing the nuclear waste up there, it reached critical mass. Critical mass is what causes a nuclear weapon to detonate. And boom, in a nanosecond, Smolensk was gone. And all the people who lived in Smolensk. Like I said, I don't consider it funny. It's, it's ironic, no. though. And all the nuclear waste was... <laughs> that was all. They took care of that. Yeah, by having another nuclear explosion. This actually, I think it was in Time Magazine. So I don't have any problem telling you this because it was the story was printed in Time magazine after we discovered this. I, they may have found out from different sources, but that I consider to be an ironic story. Hmm. I'll definitely have to try and find a link for that and uh, share it to this. Uh, well, video. yeah, but you don't look under Smolens. That's a, right. As I said, it's a no, I'll, name. I'll get the actual name for it. Not. Uh, I have one other story there. I have a there's a book over there called The Imperfect Spy. And he was the worst spy as betraying the U.S. to <laughs> Russia during the Cold War period. The worst. 
His name was George Trofimoff, and he actually worked for me briefly. I knew the guy was a flake, and I told my uh, commander, we need to get rid of this guy. I knew he was a flake. I didn't know he was selling secrets to the Russians. And um, we have people work for me or other commanders in my district that would have people 200 miles away working for him. So he didn't work in the same city, but he would be, uh, he wasn't in Munich, but he was out in Nuremberg. They called it the Befagungstelle. Uh, he was working in the Befagungstelle, an interrogation point in Nuremberg, which is a two hour drive north of Munich. And, um, but every now and then they would come in to the headquarters of Munich and we'd have a group meeting, everybody would be there and smoke and joke. And he spent most of his time flirting with the women. And, uh, and I said, just watching the guy and listen to him, the guy was a flake. <clears throat> so he got out of the uh, mil- out of the intelligence business in the late 80s, went to Florida, and uh, retired in, it was Melbourne. And uh, he was living in, he had no control over his money, he just spent everything. They're married, and suddenly we figured out, um, I mean, I was out of the military already. We figured out that uh, this guy had betrayed his country. We had no idea what the debts were. And uh, so a guy called him up, spoke perfect Russian, um, and said, um, oh, we, I'm from the KGB, we understand, we owe you money. He said, we owe you money. We didn't pay you enough. Uh, oh, comrade, please take the money. And um, so Trofimov accepted the money, boom, the FBI arrested him on the spot. It was a great big sting organization, CBS 60 Minutes actually did the thing on it. Um, and uh, an acquaintance of mine wrote the book about him, and this is all about guys in our unit too. So the book is called Imperfect Spy. And um, you could read about my unit, unit just by reading that book. And unfortunately, just like the day in Washington, you have all these intelligence leaks uh, you hear about it every day, and I think it's horrible. Uh, back then, some people, it only takes one, had casual or lackadaisical attitudes about controlling intelligence leaks. We knew that we had a spy, a mole, working in our midst because we would have agents out in the field, maybe in Russia, maybe in Poland, maybe in Czechoslovakia, that were just disappearing. Well, that was Trofimov. He was feed- feeding the information to the KGB. That's how they died. So they arrested him, they gave him life in prison in uh, Club Fed in Florida, and um, I think he was sent, he was sent to prison about 2002, and he was, uh, he died in prison, I think it was 2014. May rot now. <laughs> curious, um, when you're working in intelligence, it's, what's the working uh, atmosphere like? Is it light? Hearted, or is it real serious all the time? Or, or it depends on what you're doing. Your assignment is well to kill people. It's not very lighthearted. <laughs> but I think, as, as I said, it's usually not quite that, um, I don't know, glamorous or movie worthy. When you're paying people to answer your questions for you, it's not all that exciting watching an interrogation. I was looking for that book. I put that in the shelf here, but I don't see it often. So, oh, here's another one of mine. Excuse. Oh, that was a great debut. Oops. Would you pick those up? Oh, I'm going back up there. Thank you. Little oops here. Take a minute. <laughs> hmm? Yeah. And that shelf. Thanks. This is another one of my research projects, and I've been working on this for years. Uh, the Bible codes. I've heard what, about what, this. Uh, what is this? Uh... Well, it's a book about cracking the Bible codes. For years, the rabbis speculated that uh, there were encoded messages in the what we call the Old Testament, message encoded in the Old Testament. Uh-huh through equidistant letter skipping. In other words, every 14 letters. And they were, uh, just one example, there's a place in the Torah where the name of um, 
We tried the Nazi war criminals on Purim, that's a Jewish holiday in October, which is in October 1946. We hung them in October 1946. The trial, they were called the Nuremberg trials, that went on about a year before I remember those. And we executed 11 of the 12 that we found guilty. We found 12, we sentenced them to hang, but Hermann Goering, who was one of the guys supposed to be hung, he um, um, escaped the hangman's news because an American army lieutenant or captain gave him cyanide or some sort of poison before the day of the execution. The guy took the poison supposed to be executed. So we hung 11, not 12. And it happened on the Jewish holiday called Purim. And there's a place in the Torah where the names of all 11 war criminals are encoded and the date of their execution. Goering is not in there. He wasn't hung by us, just the 11 that were hung. I mean, it's just, there's so many astonishing. It cannot have happened by accident. I just want a small example. In our time, if you want to interview me on the Bible codes, I think it's a fascinating topic. We can do it. Oh, yeah, let's... Uh, it definitely is an interesting topic. Uh, what... Uh, what is the code? I mean, what, what, did, what it's is called it called? Hebrew distant letter skipping. In other words, you have these, when Hebrew was written in what we call the Old Testament, first of all, they went from right to left, the opposite of the way we do it. There were no punctuations, there were no spaces between words, no, no capitalization. So you had to discern where each word stopped and started. And, but it was all one run on thing. And the rabbis for centuries uh, um, speculated that there were messages from God encoded in there, not just the plain text, but you took the Hebrew text and did equal distant letter skipping on it. Finally, in the 90s, the Israelis, or in the 80s, the Israelis developed the software to search for the codes in the Torah. Now, I have it, I use it, and they found, that's what this book is about. Um, It's about some of their amazing and astonishing things that they found. It's a very complex subject. What's his name again of the book and the author? Um, right there. So people it's can look. Cracking through. the Bible Code. The man's name is Jeffrey Satinover. S A T I N O V E R. Um, it helps if you're familiar with Hebrew and statistics if you're going to study it. And I took graduate level statistics. I have a graduate degree in a business, master's degree in business administration. And I love statistics. It's the, statistics is the measure of central tendency. And um, he's familiar with those, all that stuff. And so he wrote this book. And it's just the things that have been discovered by that, um, just astonishing. Wow, fascinating. Um, that's a pretty dry subject normally to people. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, not for me. For me, it's as exciting. I don't mean I can't think of anything more exciting, frankly. Well, of course, yeah. Um, have you ever considered writing a book about uh, I mean, something that, that interests you? And uh, yeah, about I would do it about the, the Bible quotes and what they show, and about the um, we call it the Old Testament. Uh, Jews call it the Tanakh, um, uh, and the things I've seen in there through the Bible codes. They're just fascinating. Do you remember my name? Victor, do you remember mm-hmm. my name? What's yeah. my name? Um, Roth- Rothenberg. Mark Ruthenberg. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, there's a passage in uh, Zechariah where my family name, Ruthenberg, is encoded. Um, the odds of it being encoded there are billions to one against. I mean, it's statistically impossible. On the same ma- ma- matrix where my family name is encoded, also encoded is AA30. Do you have any idea what that might be, Steve? AA30, American Airlines Flight 30. Hmm. Do you know what, what was American Airlines Flight 30? Do you know? I've heard of it, but I'm drawing a blank on it at that, the moment. That was 9 11. American Airlines Flight 30 was the one that was a movie, an excellent movie made about it. Right. It was uh, hijacked by terrorists, and but That's the passengers, so familiar. the passengers said, "Let's roll," and they headed toward the cabin, took over, and then it crashed right into the Pennsylvania. Right. Everybody on board died. On that flight was a guy named Mark Ruthenberg. <laughs> 
This yeah. could not have happened by accident. Any relation to you or? No. no. <laughs> and you don't have to take my word for it. You can just Google passenger manifest flight 30. Oh, yeah. I believe you. Okay. Okay. Stop that plane before they made it to the White House. Yeah, well, they speculate. No one knows for certain. They speculate that that was the one that was going <clears> to <throat> crash into the White House. Yeah. You had two of the trade towers, one into the Pentagon, and that one was supposed to, we think, was going to go into the White House or uh, Congress building. Oh, I had some very brave people that day. Yeah, they, they were. Bless their souls. Well, Mark, we sure thank you, and I, You're welcome, Victor. I would definitely like to interview you a little farther on these, uh, like some of these subjects you like, like the, like this one, this okay. book, and. Uh, would you be open to that? Or? Yeah, sure. No. Yeah, I've got to work today. I've got a lot of stuff I have to do, but I, I'm open to you coming back again and um, doing some more interviews. Because, you know, you're a brilliant mind, so uh, that's uh, fun to listen to you. Good. And educational. Good. Well, and thank you very much, Mark. Okay. You're welcome. Gentlemen, thank you for dropping by. Okay. Oh, do you have any questions, Steve? Um. No, I'm actually pretty all good. That was a, quite the interesting interview. I learned a couple things myself that I've never known about. So um, yeah. We'll make out a list with questions and um, get more prepared. <laughs> <laughs> now that we, you know, broke the ice. Now, if you uh, send me the questions first, I might be better prepared to respond. Okay. Um, we'll definitely we can, keep that in mind. We'll, we can do that. Okay, well, thank you. All right, sir. Yeah. Okay, that's it. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening. This is the nude Servat Gem. You have a wonderful day.